Can you, can you hear me without it? Everyone in the back? I have big lungs. Okay, good. But we'll leave that mic up for questions when we get to the question part. So, hello, and thank you for having me here. It's my first year here. It's my second day. I was here at opening ceremonies. We had some time with the fans last night. It was, I was just telling everybody um, after the con how incredibly lovely everybody here has been and what beautiful energy you guys have. I'm sensitive to that stuff. And um, you guys are just like so down to earth. You're my people. I love it. So it's very, very nice to be here with you all. And it feels very comfortable. Um, is there any way you'd like me to start? I, was anybody here, uh, anybody here, were you also here last night for my talk? Okay, so I don't want to repeat too much. Do you want me to start somewhere else? Um, let's see, what would be something I could tell you about? I could tell you about what it's, a little more about directing, uh, what it's like behind the scenes for ADR stuff. I could tell you a little about um, my road, my path as an actress, um, which is everybody's experience is very unique and individual. So um, I went over a lot of that last night. What'd you say? Are you sing us a song? Oh, sing you a song? Yeah. I've never had that request. <laughs> <laughs> That's very sweet. Um, I'll have to think about that. I could, I guess. I'd be, put me on the spot. When you're an actor, uh, people often want you to, you know, they, we always say put you on a piano and start performing. They, if you're at a party or something and they know you sing, they're like, sing! Or if they know you do comedy, do some of your routine! Or if you're a dancer, come on, let's see your moves! So it's like, it puts you on the spot. And performers generally are kind of shy. I mean, there's, we fall into two categories. We're total extroverts and crazy wacky, and we have some of those here, and we've had them in the past. And then there's the other that are a little more internalized, a little more shy, but once they're on stage, uh, they just go nuts. That's kind of how Johnny Bosch is. He's very... Um, God, the first 10 years I was working with him, I didn't even know if he liked me. We, I mean, he never said anything but, hey, this is my impersonation of Johnny. Hand in the pocket. Hey, how's it going? How are you? Good. How's, how's everything going on at home? It's good, it's good. How's the band? Oh, yeah, it's good, it's good. Should we start? <laughs> That's his whole, like, and then you put him on stage, he's doing the chicken, he's, you know, like, falling around, he's just good, he's ignited by an audience. So, we play off of your energy, you know. Um, anyway, where would you like me to begin? Anybody have any, yeah? So, kind of a question that's divided into three parts. As a director, what's been your most difficult series to work on, your most interesting series to work on, and your favorite series to work on? Wow, no, nobody's asked me that. That's a good compound question. Okay, honestly, the most challenging series I've ever worked on is Bleach, for sure, hands down, because of all of the Japanese verbiage that we use, the authentic pronunciations, the duality of all the storyline that's happening in Katakuta Town on Earth, and everything that's happening in Soul Society, then add Waco Mundo, and all the different dimensions, and then it's not a linear story. Then it goes back and then characters repeat and come back. Uh, that show was kind of in a mess when I got a hold of it. They didn't have a permanent cast list. They didn't have any um, fixed convention for the terminology, for the pronunciations. And I just got in there and whipped that show into shape. I made a, a Word document of over 35 pages of Japanese words and terminology that is recurring. Um, got kind of standardized all the pronunciations, made that was really important, worked closely with the writers to make sure that we were all on the same page about what all the terminology meant. Um, I worked with Viz very closely. They would be phone patched into a recording session with me, and then I would have their feed, the patch, in my headphones in the studio. I had a Japanese native speaker on the phone telling me the pronunciation. I repeated it into the microphone. We recorded the keeper takes, so they're all on file. Whenever a, a zanpakuto or any you know any terminology comes up, the engineer types it into the system, and my audio pronunciation guide comes up. So that's one aspect, a very technical aspect of Bleach. Also, kind of we've used everybody in town several times because the cast is the cast that keeps giving more and more, more and more characters. But wait, there's more. So Bleach has been a handful. It's a big job. There's just, it's got, it's bulky in terms of uh, a lot to, to keep organized. Okay, the most. Interesting. Interesting. Let's see. 
I did this very strange series called um, Les Petites Cosettes, something like that, that was really bizarre and kind of um, uh, had that French angle, but it, it was like an amalgam of all these different cultures. It was very dark. That show was really interesting to me. Um, I loved working on the remake of Akira, but I didn't direct it. I, I played the voice of Kay. I it felt honored to be a part of such a legacy, and, and the story constantly challenges me. How many of you understand? First of all, how many of you have seen Akira? Uh, Akira? And how many of you feel like you really understand it? Yeah, <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> the hands drop significantly. So that was a trip. Um, oh, years ago, we did Metropolis. And recently, I just saw the uh, silent film version of the 1927 classic, the German film. And um, that was very interesting. That was weaving in all these um, interesting uh, symbols and terms from Masonic orders and the Illuminati and all of this stuff. So that was interesting. I really liked Outlaw Star too because that was like one of my favorite shows to direct. I had a great cast. There was all these cool elements going on. Gene was so, you know, so sarcastic and, you know, Jim was so eager and it was, and I played Twilight Suzuka in that and I loved that character. And um, I liked the imagery, the ley lines, the crystals, the, all the metaphysical nuances in that show was really challenging to me. I love that. Um, and then the most difficult? No. Our favorite. The favorite. That was my favorite series. Love Hina might have been one of my favorite se series. <laughs> it was so much fun to be Kaola Su and be crazy and just play as a wacky tomatama and then play the little the little turtle. And um, I got to cast that show for the most part, so I had all my favorite actors in it, and that was a blast. I just did a fun show last year that was very crazy. Wow, Bludgeoning Angel Dokuro-chan. Oh, oh, <laughs> crazy show, oh my gosh. She wasn't cracking you up, she was you know, bludgeoning someone. And that show was a blast too, we did it really quick. I, wrote, I adapted it, um, pretty much cast it, and then recorded all of it and played the lead, so I was very immersed in that. Um, but I think in a lot of ways, Haruhi might be my favorite series, but I'm not directing. So it's difficult to say, but um, you always feel like your favorite project is the one you're working on now, unless it presents a lot of trouble. There's a lot of production trouble, that's hard. So should we just keep going with questions? Or do you want me to, is there any area you want me to cover general? Anybody else? Yeah. Um, you, uh, this might have been before you took over the project, but I was just curious, why did they refer to Shinigamis as soul reapers in Bleach. That's um, because a good question. most of the, the Japanese um, uh, terminology is pretty much left intact, but yes. that was the one that kind of stuck out. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the other uh, Shinigami show I did. It was um, uh, not Mao Chan. Um, Mao Chan was a blast too, but right around that time I did another series. What was it? Good Angel? Bad Angel? I can't think of it right now, but in that series, we used the term Shinigami, so I was really familiar with it, and I'd had several discussions with my Japanese friends about what that meant. Um, and they say Shinigami clearly in the Japanese references on Bleach, so I too thought that was an interesting choice. Um, I think maybe they thought, I don't know why, with all the other Japanese terminology that they would choose that particular word just to localize into an English word, but I think at the time they were not planning on using as much Japanese in the series, and then they realized that the fans were really digging all the Japanese references and, and incorporating it into the English, so I think they went further and further with that concept, but that's a good question. I wondered the same thing, and I never really asked Viz straight up, so I'll have to ask them about that. <laughs> what do you prefer, the Shinigami or the Soul Reaper? Well, I'm a fan. I watch the dub religiously, but I kind of am partial to, to Shinigami. Yeah. And like uh, uh, Reishi, or yes. instead of like spiritual pressure. Or yeah, I like the Reishi too. Um, I think I just thought of the, the Risky Safety was the name of the other series I was trying to think of. Has anybody heard of that? It's, it's an unusual one, but um, I did that with, I think, Sandy Fox, and um, I think Kari Waldron was still working for us then. And, that was a great series, but it was bizarre. But I was familiar with the good, like the good ghost and the, the angel in the, on one shoulder and the, the little Shinigami on the other shoulder. And anyway, that was a, um, I thought it was better to use that term. I think that term's more specific to what it means rather than soul reaper. But it's subjective, you know. Any, any, should we just keep going with questions? Um, yeah, okay. 
Um, actually, you go ahead. Oh, you go for yeah, it. that's fine. Are you guys hearing the questions okay? All right. Just, just say louder if you need us to talk louder. Okay. Um, I just got in here, so I don't know if anybody asked this yet, but I know that you're Faye. Yes. So, did you ever, like, cry or tear up because of her story? Faye Faye's story. Yes. Yes. Um, the I don't know if you could hear her. She's asking about uh, my experience emotionally with Faye Faye. Did I ever cry or tear up? And as tough and badass as Faye is, she got me every time. There, When I went to her backstory, and um, we got into her amnesia and her you know, lost memories and all that. That storyline was so heavy for me. I mean, I was really tearing up in the studio. It was an incredible experience to not know the linear story, not have any experience with Fei Fei, be in her shoes for all these episodes, and then suddenly go back and get into why she was so closed off emotionally, why she was so tough, what she was protecting, why she was so guarded, and. Um, kind of, you know, hardened. Like, he, she always protected her heart so fiercely. She used her sensuality, but she really didn't let anybody in as a, um, a true, you know, soulmate or love. Um, so that was heavy, especially when, often when we're done recording, we'll go back and review a scene. Now it's complete, you get to sit back and watch it, and that's the best part. And then we'll watch and make notes and maybe adjust a few things, move some lines earlier or later, add some uh, breaths and nuance to just make it sound very uh, real and natural. And when we reviewed those scenes, I mean, the direct, both Mary Elizabeth and I both were like, ah, can you believe it? No wonder we love her so much. You know, it was just so intense. Um, also, of course, the last episode. I just, I, I couldn't believe we we're going to be left like that. I, I still don't believe it. There's still hope. He didn't really go away forever. He's going to come back, and we're going to get another season. <laughs> How many would like to see another season of Cowboy Viva? Thank you. You've got to tell them. I don't know why. It makes no sense to me. It was such a successful show. Why they didn't continue with it some more, or even another feature film. And you did a really good job with her voice, by the way. I love her voice. Thank you so much. I feel like Faye Faye's my um, signature character. It's probably the character I'm best known for and it's the greatest honor I think I've had as an actress in anime, certainly, because that character was assigned to me. I didn't even have to audition for that. So I don't know if that would have happened today, but at the time I was really blessed. And as I said last night, Bandai has been so good to me. So good. Uh, arigato Bandai. <laughs> okay, yes. Alrighty. Um, first of all, as a professional, I gotta say, I'm sorry I don't usually mark out like this, but I've been waiting 15 years to meet you since the Streamline and um, Saban, even the Saban era. But, um, I, so I just want to say that, and although I do have, a, I made a bet with this guy. I don't know if you remember then, because I guess the character that was portrayed in this show looked as pretty as you. Were you Amy on VR Troopers, or did you just do the voice of Red Python? Amy in, in costume? No, Amy, I, like... Because there was a similarity, but the voice was, didn't match until she became the Red Python. So I was like, I don't know. If oh, I think I did do Red Python. I think I am credited for that. I just found that out at Morphicon. I'd forgotten because we're talking about the Power Rangers days. Um, I was an ADR director on the show and played a number of the monster voices and uh, a couple incidentals. I even was on camera for, uh, for one uh, episode as a reporter. Uh, um, they put me on camera and I was reporting about uh, this hot day or something. But um, I think I did cover that. I think that was in the list of characters that I just recently saw. Okay, I, was, I just wasn't sure if you were the actress that was in, in humor for because y'all look, look different, looked the same, but the voices were different. So, Good until point. No, I wasn't playing her physically, but I think I did do the villain voice. And um, I did a number of them. I, I did. Uh, uh, aye, 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 warning rangers, we're about to crash. <laughs> so I did Alpha, I did Scorpina in the first season, I don't remember her. And she was kind of like, uh, she was the beautiful Japanese girl that was a, kind of like second command to Rita Repulsa. And so um, I covered her as like a mini, like, Rita Repulsa, I don't want to do it. Rita Repulsa's Barbara Goodson just blasting out her voice and it's just so wicked and great. We did a, a, a big Morphicon panel, or um, a, a con, in Pasadena near uh, Los Angeles just last summer. And we had a big room like this, and we were getting, we had probably 15 or 20 actors on stage, costumed actors, voice actors, all people, alumnus from the different um, seasons of Power Rangers. And we had half as many people as we have now in the audience. We were getting ready to start the panel. 
And I said, We've, there's that, hundreds of people out there. Let's get some audience in here. And they're like, well, I guess we'll just start. And I guess not many people are here. And I said, well, will you make an announcement? And they made an announcement. Nobody came in. I said, I'll be back. And everybody said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to get us an audience. So I went out into the lobby and I said, uh, attention everyone, if you'd like to come and meet um, four seasons of alumnus from the cast of Power Rangers, including me, Wendy Lee, and several others, please join me. And so a bunch of people started coming in, but not enough. So Barbara goes, I'll handle this. And she goes running out into the hallway and starts screaming, the Aaron Bosler says to get in here right now. That's an order. And the whole room was full. <laughs> So anyway, that that was kind of my mainstay on, on Power Rangers. Is that all your questions? Well, I guess one more. Are you now that Saban's reacquired those uh, that property or or that franchise? Are you back with them now? Or are you thinking about going back? Oh, that's or? a really good point. Since we're going to continue with questions, I just want to say go ahead and line up on the mic, and we'll get the next questions going. Um, the if you have a question, go for it. Um, the question was, am I reunited with Saban now that they've reacquired Power Rangers from Disney? And, um, and actually, the answer is vague, because I know Tony Oliver is working with them in some capacity, and he and I work very closely together. Uh, most of what they're doing is happening in New Zealand, but they did bring back season one. And ironically, in the studio where I'm directing Bleach, right next door to it is an editing bay. And I walk out from Bleach one day, and I hear my voice coming out of Alpha 6 in the editing bay. And I walk in and go, that sounds just like, and it's Power Rangers on, and, it, and their work, they were editing season one. So that's airing again. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but that's, that's I've seen it a couple times, Saturday mornings, I think. Um, that's airing again, and it may be to create the buzz by bringing back the older seasons for what's about to come, the newer seasons. But I, I hope so. I always had a great relationship with Saban. Not everybody did. Mine was very, very fair, and they gave me wonderful directing opportunities. They let, let me uh, write, direct, sing, um, write lyrics. I mean, they really gave me wonderful vehicles to work through. So we have a, a great relationship, and if they, if they open up the opportunity, I'll be there for sure. Awesome. I hope so. Oh, Thanks. Thank you. Okay, step right up. Hey. Hi, my name is Fred. Hi, uh, just have a, a question. Like, uh, yesterday, uh, you said that uh, fan subs are like hurting the anime industry in the U.S. So, if you had like unlimited like resources, what would you do to address this problem? Oh, uh, the fan sub and illegal downloads. Yeah. Wow. I wish I could. I wish I could solve the world's problems. <laughs> you know, I wish. Um, I I feel like content should be. Uh, check. Wait, this on. No. Um, I feel like contact should be at a reduced price. So fans maybe get more extras and are encouraged to buy the, the material instead of just getting it illegally. I always feel like you as fans are pretty much being milked financially. Like you're, you're always having to fork out money for content, for the toys, for the posters and the manga. And I don't know, I don't know if it's difficult, but I know often I talk to fans and they say, I'd love to see your next series, but I can't afford to buy it yet. So I think that might be part of it, bringing the price down a little bit, um, or offering more, more extras. Also, having more broadcast. I'd like to see more networks picking up anime and airing it. That'd be awesome. Yeah, instead of just, do you guys, you guys get Cartoon Network out here, right? Yeah. yeah. That's really the only channel I know of other than sci-fi. What are some of the other anime channels that you guys know of? That's like it. The Funimation channel. Funimation, did you get it here? Yeah, I don't, well, I don't think we get it in California either. Yeah, do you know somebody over there said, well, I think that's, an, that's one of the reasons, and honestly, I think it is a programming glitch. I think that they should have a way to protect and, and um, disable the ability to illegally, illegally download. I don't know how you do it, but maybe uh, broadcast the content from the uh, studio's website and lock it so it can't be copied. But don't release, also if we had concurrent releases, if we release a uh, title in Japan with the English dub at the same time, I think that would curve a lot of it. But those of us behind the scenes and all the actors are very concerned about this because honestly, <laughs> anime is completely going away in Los Angeles. There are only two studios out of maybe 15 that I know of that have any anime going on at all. And both of them are are just completing shows like um, Studioopolis that has Naruto and, and um, Bleach. 
they're just completing an order that's already a commitment. But I don't know anybody that's starting new animation for, uh, new dubs for anime. I haven't had an anime audition in ages, maybe close to a year, and that's a first ever in my career. So I'd hear that. I know, me too. So keep supporting, and you know, your emails to the companies makes a difference. If you go to their websites and comment and say, we want the dubs, they listen to that because that translates into sales to them, and they care about that. So we're working on it. We're still trying to bring you more. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, um, getting into one of my favorite shows ever made, what was it like working on Megas XLR? Oh, I forgot Megas. That's like my <laughs> favorite original animation. Okay, Megas XLR was a dream show. I can't even believe how that came about. The creators of that show wrote the parts of Kiva and Jamie for Steve Blumenite. And they had the agent, they had their producers go out and find us. We still had to audition, and it was interesting. I had like three callbacks for that particular gig, but but we um, uh, we ultimately got to have two seasons, and we were so disappointed when it ended after two seasons. At the time, Cartoon Network said that mech shows were not popular. Now, how many mech shows are there? <laughs> you know, it's just crazy. So. We love that it was a partnership with Madhouse in Japan, so it was half anime, but it was set in New Jersey. It was just this crazy combination, and, and Steve used to bust out his girl scream all the time, and that just floors me every time I hear it. Every time he just hears this nice deep voice, and he's like, ah! I'm just like on the floor, he's crazy. And um, David DeLuise, Dom DeLuise's son, was our lead, and he was a complete roller coaster. I mean, the guy was just bouncing off, literally, he would make a mistake in the studio and, and start to go, okay, okay, I've got this, let's do it again. Then we'd shoot it again and he'd, he'd blow another line and he would like fall on the floor, jump off the walls, and it was just like crazy. So it was always a really fun session. I loved working on Megas XLR. My only concern about that was my character Kiva seemed very one note. She was very calm and she was the level-headed intellectual one. So I wanted to see them explore more wacky scenarios for her. And I got one where she went, they took her to the mall and had to buy her some clothes. Yeah, we went through some funny stuff there. We were hoping in seasons three and four that we would explore her character more. It didn't happen. How many of you have heard of Megas XLR? All right. All right, thank you. Good, I'm not the only one. Yes, <laughs> nice. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Amen, buddy. Hey. So you're a chick who digs giant and giant robots. Say yes. it one more. Uh, um, you're a chick who digs giant robots. That's right. Giant robots. You better believe it. Okay. <laughs> um, I would like to know what is your personal opinion on poor kids and any drama that they have been having now, as in currently in the past month. So sad. I know very little about this because my contact with them is only through the actors that have moved from New York to Los Angeles. It's exclusively a New York company, so I don't know them very well, but I know that uh, in my animation, um, in my production newsletter that I get, I saw that they were filing for bankruptcy. And it's just, it has been a long chain of bad news for anime for the last probably 18 months. It's just one of those things, it's obvious, you don't shit the people who feed you your stuff. It's rough. You know, it's really, it's really unfortunate, but people do desperate things in desperate times, and yeah. I mean, even at Viz, one day I, I showed up to work, and I'd been working with the same staff for, for God, almost three years, and all of a sudden one day I went to call my producers, and they were gone. The company cut 40% of their staff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a lot of our, this is what I'm saying about anime is really struggling because of I'm sorry to say, but it's the illegal downloads and not purchasing is just killing our industry. And um, I do think it's more of a technological thing that they need to lock the content somehow. Of course, I'm not a programmer. I have no idea how you do that, but <laughs> they, um, they're really hurting. So that I don't like hearing about companies going under, even if they're competition. And it is. We are all very competitive between studios and cities. But the best of New York seems to have landed in Los Angeles. Sam Regal, um, Yuri Lowenthal, Megan Hollingshead, um, Liam O'Brien, I mean, all these guys, are, you know, have come to, to join us and are, you know, mainstays now. They love living in California. Okay. So we're Thank glad you. to have them. Hello. 
I'm Hassan. Um, since you're working for the voice acting and also the directing the shows, um, I'm wondering uh, what's the some shows that you shows or some project that you wanted to work on in the future? Something I'd like to do in the future? Yes. Oh, I would be very happy to have any series in the future right now. <laughs> Work has been very slow, unfortunately. The slowest ever in my career. I'm used to working day and night, and it's been very unusual. I haven't had a lot of time to garden lately. <laughs> but I'm back to work on a really big project I'm directing now, thank goodness. But um, the only thing that I, I would love to, that I know of, would just to be able to get the next season of Haruhi going. I'd love to continue both uh, Lucky Star and the Melancholy of Haruhi. That would be wonderful. Um, I hear that there was a, another season of Outlaw Star that had been floating around. I'd love to be able to get a, a shot at that. Um, as far as new titles go, I don't get a lot of information about that. I generally don't hear about something until it's ready to go into production. Uh, I wish that we had gotten Death Note. That uh, one was a, was a, darn it, I wish we had had that. Um, there's a couple others that have come and gone, but there's there's nothing immediately that I know of. Is there something that you might recommend? Is there any new shows coming that might be dubbed? Or that you hope would be dubbed? Ghosting? Yeah. Oh yeah? What's it like? Uh, it's, uh, kind of like a Sherlock Holmes. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, if, if Sherlock Holmes was a high school girl. Oh, that sounds cool. Mm -hmm. I like it. <laughs> Shoot. Yes. Well, fingers okay. crossed. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask a question and say I loved your work in How to Be a Lucky Star. Thank you. And I want to know what was it like working on both of those shows? And uh, are you guys going to dub the movie for How to Be? I just finished dubbing the movie for How to Be two weeks ago. So that is it's very exciting. We've been waiting forever. I think we waited like almost nine months to be able to, to actually work on that. So that was very exciting. It's a such a strange way of approaching the character. It's her, I call her the mature version in high school at the other high school until she realizes about who she really is and goes into the hyper girl again. Um, Lucky Star has just been a blast. It's such an easy character for me because she's, she's so laid back. So she's, you know, really, she's just a blast, and I feel so honored that I got to have both of those characters. But I mentioned this last night, uh, the same actress that, in Japan, that voices both of those characters uh, is kind of like a counterpart to me, so they wanted me to also have both of those parts and keep it consistent with one voice actor covering both. So that's really been a fun, fun time on both shows. I'm so glad you liked them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. My question is about, uh, you know how you did the uh, voiceover for How To Be? Yes. Um, did it take some time for you to adjust to the type of person How To Be is because she's so confident and strong in everything she does, or was it easy for you? Honestly, um, you guys out still hearing me fine? Okay. Honestly, How To Be was a character that I, I did not take much acclamation for me. She's akin to my energy. She's kind of high energy and bubbly and outgoing and expressive. Those are the characters I'm kind of known for, that kind of energy. So um, that was not difficult for me. What was a little difficult for me is understanding that she influenced the entire universe and that it revolved around her because I haven't seen any of the show other than her scenes, uh, except for the film. I saw, I saw the whole, most of the film. Um, so my experience as Haruhi as voicing her is very much like her own, that she doesn't know those things, and it makes it uh, easier to sort of have that confidence and, and um, what, she's just such, she's so bossy, and she's so demanding, and all of that, it's like, plays out my fantasies if I could just be a big brat all the time, like that's the way I would be. And I tell, I often tell people in the studio, I said, you gotta be careful, it's not easy being the center of the universe when you go home at night, 
because I go home at night and clean the cat box and I'm right back down to square one. <laughs> it's very humbling, yes. Get a, oh, okay, I'm down to my last 10 minutes, guys, so let's get a couple more questions. I love doing Digi one. <gasps> Thank you! <laughs> TK thinks you're the coolest girl ever, but you'd only be second coolest to my biggest brother, Matt. Because Matt's the coolest of all the Digimon. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. So, yes, hello. Yes, hello again. Uh, uh, so, I just wanted to know, so what's it, it, since you guys get paired together on projects quite often, what's it like working with Steve Blum? You know, I miss Steve. We used to work together all the time. We did Big O, um, obviously Bebop and Magus. We've had other series together. I can't think of them, but I feel like he's the natural pairing for me. Like our voices are very complementary for each other and work. Uh, we have a, a similar edge and I'd like to think it's also similar as sexiness. That's very cool, because I, I, whenever I'm in the studio and I hear Steve's voice in the speakers and the big monitors, it just gives me goose pimples. He is, he moves me. I mean, he is an amazing talent, and he has such, well, I always say chicks dig his voice. Yeah, chicks dig it. I mean, the girls have no problem listening to him in the studio. Yeah, he's, he's just so, God, yummy and just got that cool range that he has. And he's so funny. He gives the most nasty outtakes. The funniest bloopers. They're just dirty. <laughs> it's so much fun. So I love work. He's my favorite counterpart of all the actors I work with. And Johnny Bosch is really very close to us. Very close second, if not a first. I mean, he's right there, too. We have an awful lot of fun together. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Welcome again. Thank you. Thank you. by the way. Oh, Bailey. Nice, oh, Bailey. Yes, I remember you from yesterday, yes. Anyway, um, we need more bloopers. Do you, do you like the bloopers, you guys? Woo! Yes. All right, all right. That's excellent. Well, I'm always care I always assign a blooper track to anything that I'm working on. I say, can we please run, tell the engineer, let's set up a blooper track. And if I hear something juicy, I'm like, pull it to the blooper track. Let's keep it. And commentary as well. But um, what I want to know is, if you could say anything to Kyo, I mean, uh, going back to her, if you could say anything to Kyo, what would you say? To who? Kyo. Uh, oh, to Kyo. Kyo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Say, I would say, you're late, Kyo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's all good. I know that um, be being a voice actor, it's a little hard to, to do anime and get, uh, get it to pay the bills solely. So I was wondering, um, what other um, forms of uh, voiceover work do you like to do? Like original animation, narration of like uh, documentaries or whatnot? The answer is yes. Uh, video games? Yes, to everything. It's very, it's very hard as a voice actor to ever say no. Because we're in a world of freelance, we don't have regular hours, we have no set income. You always feel like your last job is your last job and you'll never work again. Um, I actively have to pursue employment, even at this point in my career. It's, uh, especially with anime going away at the rate that it is. Um, so I do a lot of dubbing on films. I just worked a little bit on Hoodwink 2. I have some incidental voices that I did on that and some Walla. I uh, have been dubbing some um, foreign films. I did a beautiful Chinese movie called Little Sister that's coming out soon. And uh, that's a gorgeous feature film, high budget feature film. And I dubbed the mother's voice in that. She's like the mother of the Cinderella character. That was a wonderful experience. Um, I do a fair amount of commercial work, not that much. A little bit of radio. I'm interestingly the voice of AT&T and Wells Fargo if you ever get an automated phone call from them. <laughs> and I literally say, hi, this is Wendy from Wells Fargo calling to tell you if you haven't activated your credit card by May 15th, you'll need to do so. Uh, you know, it's like this whole, yeah. This one, I do a number. Yeah, I'm that, I'm, and that's AT&T. And there's something about Wells Fargo is some of the um, consolidation of banks, and I'm, I'm the voice telling you, your new Wells Fargo card will be arriving soon. Please activate your PIN when you can. Yeah. So, I mean, as a voice actor, you, you just kind of have to be open to every employment opportunity. Well, I mean, like, what kind of stuff do you prefer outside of uh, anime? Like, I do love, 
I mean, original animation is, I think, all of our goal. That's the thing that we all want to do the most of. It pays the best, it has nice residuals, and it airs widely so you really are heard. Um, and you're working with some of the best actors in the world. They're incredible. A lot of celebrities are involved now, too, which isn't always my favorite. I don't always think celebrity voices translate the best for voiceover, but sometimes there's some really good talent in that mix. Uh, but it's incredibly political. It's even, again, at, at, you know, after 20 plus years in my career, I am challenged to be a part of original shows. It's, you know, if the director doesn't know me or if my agent doesn't have clout with that company, it's difficult to get in. But original animation is what I, I would set out to be a part of originally when I got into voice work. And, um, and I've ended up doing everything under the sun that includes voicing, including promos and things like that too, but yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We get down to our last two questions, I think. Love Hi, Dan. <laughs> name is Rex, by the way. Thank you. Okay. So, you know the, the melancholy of Haruhi Chan Suzumiya? The, the little, the chibi ones? Yeah. Yeah. Did you enjoy working on that, in that series? Yeah, I was so surprised to see. I always think of them as the squishy versions, you know? Because um, Haruhi's voice is kind of somewhere here. She's like the higher end of my natural voice. And when it's time for the SOS Brigade's meeting to begin, now that's kind of where Haruhi would sit. But as a chibi voice, she gets a little squishier and it gets more up on my nose and just kind of the whole thing squishes down. So it's a different way of approaching Haruhi because I think of Haruhi still as being somewhat of an elegant character. She's, she's classy, you know, she's not, She's not crude like Konata, which would translate into the chibi really easy. So it was a little hard for me to balance the voice placement and still make it recognizable. But I thought the shows were funny. I had a lot of fun working on it. They were, they were funnier than the Endless Eight. That thing went on forever. <laughs> and a quick one. If Haruki was a character from Star Wars, what did she say? <laughs> You know, you're like the third person that's asked me something like that. What is the connection? What? That is amazing to me. What made you think of that? Well, I saw this YouTube video. And is that what it is? Yeah. And what happens in the video? Well, apparently, you were saying this quote from Star Wars. Okay, so you heard somebody's asked me to repeat that information. Okay, and then I also got a drawing of Haruhi as a cast member of Star Wars. Somebody gave me this beautiful fan art, and that blew my mind. But I, I'm going, okay, now this is interesting because it's come up three times now. Um, I think she could fit in the, a futuristic world so easily because her mind's so wide open to espers and time travel and you know, aliens and shapeshifters. I just wonder what she would actually, how she'd really respond if somebody like shapeshifted right in front of her eyes. If, if it would absolutely blow her mind and she couldn't handle it or she'd be like, I want to do that, you know? <laughs> so I don't know, she'd probably, she probably wouldn't have patience for Princess Leia. She probably would be, you know, like messing up hovercraft and, you know, and hijacking stuff and breaking rules and, you know, getting in trouble, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, is there anything else? I think this might be a good place to wrap up. Is this the end of our time? Thank you so much.